Well, hello. This is Plant Dr. Bob here at Waterloo Gardens in Exton, and I'd like to talk with you about how to care for these beautiful Easter plants and also uh, how to care for them out in the garden later on. Now, first thing we have to recognize is that bulb plants are very short-lived, uh, especially in the warmth of our home. So if we can put them in a cooler place uh, in the home, that would be good. Certainly where the light would be bright diffused at the very least and full sun at the very best, but ideally on the cool side. And certainly in the evenings, we could put them down in the garage or the refrigerator, maybe even if it out, outside if it's above freezing. We certainly don't want to freeze them because they have been forced, they're a bit soft. So besides light, we want to water each time the soil feels dry and the soil will change color from this dark color to of course a light color as you see here on this spent crocus. So you can feel it and when it needs water, take it to the sink and give it a really, really big drink that it's soaking wet. The bulb producers oftentimes have the soil coming right up here close to the surface, so there's not a lot of room to water. That's why I emphasize taking it uh, to the sink and putting it uh, there in a soup kettle or something and really getting it good and wet when you do water it because of the difficulty of getting the water in. So those are the basics of care inside, and then certainly once the bulbs are done blooming, and we have a crocus here to show you the difference uh, between a fresh one and one that's uh, out of flower, um, you know, you'll be wanting to plant them out in your garden somewhere. And uh, you'll want to choose a place that is well drained. Uh, the bulbs have to have good drainage. And they'll grow anywhere from partial shade through full sun. And they, of course, have been used to being indoors uh, where it's uh, quite warm and they will have stretched and they will have gotten quite soft compared to the bulbs outside. You say, well, Bob, you know, I've got daffodils in bloom outside now. Well, inside, of course, they're going to stretch and get quite floppy like this and get quite soft and they'll probably not be, obviously, in full sun in your home. So we want to reacclimate them to the outside uh, and not just take them right outside and plant them in the garden. The danger being, of course, that we still will be getting frost uh, there into May and these plants have been softened up uh, in our warm homes. So we'll want to put them out uh, you know, in the, next to the house in the partial shade or partial sun. Um, and if we don't, here's a crocus showing you some of the sun scald where this was taken right from the greenhouse and put outdoors in the full sun. And you can see how bleached and gray the foliage is here in the middle uh, from that full sun. So you want to put them out in that partial shade situation and then if it's going to freeze at night bring them back in because they're, they're soft. They can actually freeze to that even though they're hardy plants just because they've been so used to that warm in the home. Alright so we'll get them used to this uh, brighter light then and we'll gradually move them to a full sun position uh, over a period of two weeks and then that'll be probably early May and they will take some light frost at that point. They will be toned up again to the cold and the sun and at that point then we'll want to dig a hole to plant the plants in in an appropriate place. Maybe make a little lovely arrangement like this where you have a bulb grouping. And the thing you want to recognize is that when the bulb planters plant these, they plant the very nose or top of the bulb right here at the very top of the soil. Well, as you may well realize that typically the instructions for these daffodils is to plant them six inches deep from the very nose to the top of the soil. So that means you're going to be digging a hole uh, that's going to be, let's see how deep this pot is. That pot is about f five inches deep. So that means you're going to be digging an 11 inch deep hole to get this bulb down at the right level that these bulbs then do not freeze to death during our winter. And you need to figure our frost line, we have a cold winter, can be as deep as, as six inches. That's why we specify to plant these major bulbs like the daffodils, the hyacinths, and the tulips down six inches below the level of the soil. So that means you're going to dig quite a deep hole to put these down in. And then of course we um, will refill some soil down in there, uh, but we need to leave the foliage exposed to the sunshine so we get uh, the regeneration of the bulbs. So you'll be able to fill this in maybe, oh, about up to here, uh, and then leave all that other foliage exposed, and then gradually fill the hole in later on once your bulb foliage goes completely yellow and starts to die off, okay? And you don't want to remove the foliage so it goes completely yellow. And in the meantime, it's going to be recharging that bulb for next year. 
that you can flower again the following year. Now with the little minor bulbs like the crocus and the grape hyacinth here, uh, those we only plant three to four inches deep. So you won't have to dig as deep a hole for those. That's four, let's add three to four. We're gonna dig a seven to eight inch deep hole for these little minor bulbs to get those down at the correct level uh, to the uh, frost. Now the other thing that we need to do for the bulbs to rejuvenate them for the following year is we need to feed them. And the bulbs are quite heavy feeders. So after we plant them, we're going to want to put the bulb tone uh, in the ground there on top of them and around them according to the package directions that we rejuvenate them for the following spring. And ideally, the textbooks recommend that we feed the bulbs every fall. So that allows the food time to get washed in by the rain and the snow that is way, way down at that root level by spring when the bulbs wake up and need it to rejuvenate themselves. So feed them here in the spring when you're planting them in your garden, and then again in the fall, and then every fall thereafter. You'll find that certainly if you don't feed the hyacinths and the tulips and the lilies, those usually get smaller over time and eventually disappear if you don't feed them. Here we are in the greenhouse where it's a lot warmer than out where we were with the bulbs that like it cool. These are some of our lilies that we have here for Easter. Now these emerge later than the other bulbs that we looked at, and so uh, they're more tender to the cold. And we'll want to wait till after frost is over outdoors there in mid-May before we put these out in our garden. Once again, we'll want to adjust them gradually to the higher light, put them out in the part shade, part sun, and then gradually in two weeks move them into full sun so we don't sun scald them as that little crocus was sun scalded. Well, here with the Asiatic lilies, the typically on all the, all the bulbs, the, the bulb is about here in the middle of the pot because the lilies grow roots off their stems. So the bulb producers plant them deeper because they have the roots off the bottom as well as off the stem tissue. All right, so here we won't have to dig as deep a hole as we did for those other spring bulbs. We still want to be six inches from the top of the bulb to the top of the soil. All right, so there we go. And once again, we're going to fill in the hole gradually because we need to leave all the foliage exposed to the sunshine to rejuvenate the bulb. Here's our Asiatic, and those typically come in yellow and orange, red, uh, pink, uh, purple. Uh, and they just bloom once a year, usually in June. And then we have the um, oriental lilies back here. And this happens to be a sans souci lily. These have a very heavenly fragrance. And those also just bloom once a year, usually in July. Then with our um, Lilium longiflorum, our Easter lily, these will actually send up a new spike from the bulb and bloom in early August for us. So we do. We can get a second enjoyment on the lovely, lovely fragrance of our Easter lily. And be sure and put the bulb food in according to package instructions. All the bulbs are very heavy feeders. And once again, you have to do this to rejuvenate the bulbs and have them flower very, very well for you. So be sure and put that on here when you're planting them. And also, of course, again in the fall. Here we are at another spot in the greenhouse where we have our beautiful florist hydrangea display. Now, these are known as mop head hydrangeas. And they're hardy outdoors here in Pennsylvania. They grow anywhere from part shade through full sun. They're very, very thirsty plants, and I have this one deliberately to show you, to show you what they look like here when they start to need water. They really show their displeasure. Uh, so you can feel the soil, and it's, it's on the dry side. So do keep a very, very close watch on your hydrangeas because they're very, very thirsty plants, both as a potted plant and in the ground outside. All right, so when these are all done flowering and the heads have turned brown, we'll want to take and, of course, cut the very tip off here of the flower where it has gone brown. These are also uh, plants that have not leafed out yet out of doors and will not have leafed out very much by the time uh, we get uh, to uh, mid-May. So you'll want to be careful when you put them out. They're after danger of frost in mid-May. Once again, start in the shade, part shade and gradually shift them to the full sun so you don't sun scald them and bleach them. Then, when you dig your hole, dig the hole twice as wide as the root ball. So let's take a look. This is about, oh, six and a half inches. So we want to dig about a 12 inch, 12 and a half inch wide hole for this, but we'll only dig it as deep as the ball, which you can see is about six inches. 
and we'll mix peat moss or our uh, tree and shrub soil 50-50 with the topsoil that we're going to fill in in the hole. And unlike the bulbs that we looked at previously, this one we want to plant at the same depth that it was growing at in the pot. So we do not plant this deeper. Our nursery stock, you plant it at the same depth it was growing. And we'll loosen up this little hard pane layer. Because you see this is kind of hard and cakey in here. And the water is going to kind of hit that and run off. So we want to loosen that up when we put it in the ground so that the water will penetrate easily and not hit that hard ball and run around. Well, with the hydrangeas, they're also heavy feeders. And so we'll want to add some of our plant tone fertilizer for our pink ones and some lime to make sure that they stay pink. And we'll want to watch them for water, check them, uh, you know, regularly and uh, water them each time that they're dry, hopefully not as dry as this one, um, you know, until they're well knitted with the soil. You will need to watch them all the way until the ground freezes this fall and water them as you see the need. Be sure and water really heavily and thoroughly. If you take some of your extra soil and make a little uh, berm around the edge of your pocket, that will help to hold the water uh, in the pocket so it goes in rather than running off to the side. And that's always an important thing when we dig our holes for nursery stock to make that berm around the edge. If you're on a slope, well, you'll have the berm, of course, just on the lower sides and build up more to keep the water from running down the slope. All right, well, the hydrangeas will get larger over the years. You've probably seen they get up uh, quite high. And uh, typically, uh, you, we need to prune them to keep the height down. And that is something that we do as soon as they're done blooming in midsummer. If you need to uh, shorten them or uh, keep the width from growing over the sidewalk, that's when you want to do your cutting uh, to shear them down and hold them back for size. In the spring, all we do is come in and trim out the dead wood uh, because the flower buds are already formed on the wood. If we have a hard winter and the bush gets killed back pretty severely, you may lose your flowering for that year because those buds are already set in that wood. All right, let's take a look over at the blue hydrangeas next. Well, here we are with the blue hydrangeas and the white hydrangeas. And the blue ones, in order to have them stay blue, we need to make sure we apply the soil acidifier to make the soil more acid. And we also need to apply the holly tone for our fertilizer rather than the plant tone. And that will help to make sure that they stay this beautiful, beautiful shade of blue that you see them here. Now, if you get stuck in between on the pH, between uh, the uh, alkaline and the acid, the hydrangea can actually be mixed colors all over or it can be more of a mauve or lavender color where it's kind of stuck in between the pink and the blue. The white one, don't worry, you can feed that with the holly tone or the plant tone. You cannot affect the color of the white ones. Now also you might have gotten a forced azalea for Easter and um, those also then are hardy outside and those can grow in the full shade or in the full sun. Once again, wait till after frost uh, and then gradually acclimate them to the outdoors uh, before you plant them outside where they're going to go. The azaleas also are quite thirsty, uh, so watch them for water. And they love, love peat moss, just really love it. So make sure you incorporate lots of peat moss or the tree and shrub soil when you plant these and watch them for water very, very carefully there until they're all knitted out once again. Then in the fall, it'd be a good idea there in November to spray them with some wilt proof and that'll help to prevent the winter burn from occurring on the azaleas, especially the first year until uh, they're really thoroughly knitted. Now this happens to be a tender azalea. This is a florist azalea and it is only hardy to 28 degrees. So this one you will have to keep as a potted plant. Certainly uh, you'll shift it up to a larger pot uh, because they're quite uh, well rooted when you receive them. And so you go from the six to an eight inch and you'd set it outdoors there for the summer and give it uh, your uh, mere acid uh, very regularly through the summer and early fall. And then of course, when we get near danger of hard freezing, you'll bring this back indoors and put it in front of a sunny window and it will bloom for Christmas for you on a normal schedule. Or if you keep it in a colder place while well, you can have it blooming uh, in the winter or for Easter in the spring. So that is our azalea. And uh, that is all we need to talk about for the forced hardy plants that can go in the garden and stay in the garden. 
I hope you have good luck with your Easter things and I hope you have many years of enjoyment in your garden with them. Thank you.